All right. Well, welcome tonight. I think we're going to just be on audio only out there in uh, uh, online land. But my name is uh, Isaac Johnson, and I'm the associate pastor here at LifeSpring Bible Church. And for all of us tonight, what we're going to start out with is I want you to, uh, we're going to just take a little test. I'm going to call this the waiting test. It's not a pass or a fail. But I'm going to give you some scenarios, and I just simply want you to think to yourself, would this be a scenario that would make you better or worse? Would it make you more agitated or more relaxed? So we'll kind of go through these, and I'm not going to ask you to give your answers later on or anything like that. The first one is waiting to be seen at the doctor's office. Does waiting to be seen at the doctor's office make you more relaxed or more stressed? I guess it maybe depends on what you're waiting to see you seen about. But The next one is being on hold, waiting to talk to a technical support rep. Ah, that can be a rough one. Make you better or worse? Waiting for water to boil. I swear, if you watch it, it'll never boil. You turn your back for a second, it's like gone. Waiting for the movie to begin at the movie theater. Now, when I was a kid, there was only like two or three previews, but now I swear there's like 45 minutes of previews. So I think they should just have a movie called Coming Attractions and at least you'd know what you expect. Waiting for a response to a text. This is actually more challenging than it sounds, but you've given somebody a text waiting for a response. Waiting in traffic, that's always a tough one. And then for those of you who have traveled in the last six months or so, dealing with a delayed or canceled flight. Yeah, yeah. Pastor Carl would know a lot about that. Uh, they've had a lot of problems there when they went to visit family. And the reason I, I kind of bring this up so just kind of keep those answers in your mind as you go along tonight. But if, if Isaiah 40, 31 tells us, if we wait upon the Lord, we will be renewed and strengthened. My question tonight is, why do so many of us look anxious, agitated, and even exhausted while we are waiting for God to come through? You know, and I see this a lot with people I work with in counseling, and it's like, they're believers. They know God's going to do what he says he's going to do intellectually, and yet... They just seem constantly stressed out. And I think this really was apparent in the pandemic over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, and it just we, we all knew intellectually that it wasn't going to last forever. I think at the beginning we thought maybe six weeks. That's what they were telling us. Then it was like six months. Then I think we started thinking six years, you know. But, it, but we're, as we're now kind of getting to the end of it, I mean, it's always going to be here to some degree, but the, the, the big part's... I really noticed that all of us can be broken down into three groups of people. And, and there's, there's those people that went through the pandemic and were better on the other side. They were more mature, relationally, physically, spiritually, emotionally. There's those people that didn't make it. And I'm not talking about the people that died from COVID-related symptoms. I'm talking about the people who took their own life simply because they just felt like there was no hope. They got desperate and they just gave in. And then that was, that's unfortunately, very sad. And then the last group is, is the group I think a lot of us fall into. We just don't want to admit it. And those are the people that got through the pandemic. But unfortunately, now we're more anxious, more isolated, more agitated, more fearful than when the thing started. You know? And what is the difference between those three groups? The difference is those who learned to wait well. Because truth is, God's going to let us wait a lot in life. He's got eternity, so he's in no hurry. And sometimes he creates scenarios to make us wait. Sometimes they're just created for us. But the truth is we're going to have to worry or we're going to have to wait. And I think too many of us are seeking relief from waiting instead of renewal. Because I see this all the time. People are like, oh, thank God it's over. And I'm not saying, you know, you should thank God when something's done and all that. But I also think, like, why are we so relieved? Or why are we so surprised when God comes through instead of expect it? You know, it's just I was like, oh, I can't believe he did that. Like, well, he said he would do it, you know, and he's never failed you yet. And yet there's this part of us as a human being that's like, this time for sure. This time he's going to get me. So the truth is, is, is we need to learn to wait well because we're going to have to wait a lot. And as we're waiting for God to come through, um, it's going to be important 
how we turn out, how we get, you know, God may fulfill the promise, but how we deal with it and how we turn out is going to be up to us. And so the question is, is how do we wait well? And tonight we're just going to look at two, two men in the Old Testament, um, Joseph and Abraham. Both of them, God gave promises to them. Uh, Joseph, at about age 17, um, saying that he was going to be a, a leader uh, of some sorts. People were going to bow down to him. Abraham, probably about the age of 75, they think. And, um, you know, and, and his situation was going to be that he was going to have a son named Isaac. Really cool name. Um, and that Isaac was going to be the, you know, that heir to this great nation, the, eventually the Israelites that God created. And so both of them were given these great promises. And yet you see the difference is Joseph waited well and Abraham did not. And so what we want to look at, just the, we're going to look at these two stories and I, I want to draw from them four principles that I think we can kind of abide by that will help us wait better, whatever we're going through. And so when we look at the story, the first thing that we want to learn to do is we want to start learning to ask God what instead of how. Because so often when we're going through something, it's, God, how could you possibly make this happen? How will this, how long will this last? And you look in Genesis 17, 17. So 17, chapter 17, verse 17. And this is Abraham after he's been told by God all these great things. And it says, he fell face down and he laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And, you know, it's kind of like he's just sitting there going, how are you going to do this, God? He was questioning how God was going to do it. Even though he had already had some experiences with God prior where God had come through in some cool ways. You know, but it's like looking for how God will do a miracle distracts us from preparing for the miracle. And you look at Joseph, and you don't see any situation. Now, we don't know if he questioned. I'm sure he had moments. But we don't see documented where he goes, how are you going to do this, God? And he went through some very difficult things, too. And we see how their stories kind of divert as we go along. Joseph did not question God's motives while Abraham did. And I think the, the, what we can gain from this is that if Satan can get us to question how God will do something in our life, he can get us to believe that God won't do it. And that then creates sometimes some major chaos, as we're going to see in Abraham's life. And then if he can get us to believe that God won't do it, it can derail us with a sense of hopelessness and discouragement, which can then just lead to all kinds of things. So, so that first statement, that principle is, is we want to be able to say, every time that we're going through something, that we're having to wait for God in some area, I've just learned to just start going, okay, God, what do you want to do with this time? What do you want to do to make me better? I loved when, when the, the first sermon I heard when the pandemic started was the, with this pastor, and he said, you better be better on the other side. He goes, I can't tell you when it's going to end, but you better be better on the other side. And that was kind of my motto throughout the whole time. And I don't, I, only God knows if I am or not, but that was what I was really shooting to do. And so, but it's that temptation to keep asking how. So we want to ask, what, God, do you want me to do? Once we've gotten that, the second thing is, while we're going through a difficult time, while we're waiting for God, we want to make sure that we are consulting the right sources. And we see in Genesis 16 too, now you've got Sarah talking here, and it says, So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. And then here's the clinching part of it. Abraham agreed to what Sarai had said. He had a choice in that moment. He could have said, no, that's probably not a good idea, you know, but he agreed with her decision and he listened to her. And so you look at Joseph, he listened to God and the authorities God put in his life while Abraham listened to his wife. And I'm not saying that he shouldn't listen to his wife, so don't get me wrong here, but he listened to the enemy speaking through her. You know, and I think that's true. A lot of times, God, you know, Satan can speak through all kinds of different situations. And if we're not really paying attention to the right source, then while we're waiting for God, we're going to get distracted, derailed by some things. And this is evident to me, like over the years when I was working with clients as a counselor, I always knew the session was going to be off to a, a rough start 
when I met them for the very first time and these words came out of their mouth. So I was on WebMD or I was Googling and I think this is my problem. And I was like, well, gosh, should I even charge you? You already know what to do. You know, why did I go to six years of school? You already got this figured out. Because what was going on there is, is they were looking for the right answers, but they were looking for sources that were going to confirm what they probably already believed. You know, and sometimes people want a diagnosis. It just becomes their thing that makes them just feel okay to know that this is true or not true. And so that was always a tough one where I'd say, well, I don't think that's the case, but let's kind of backtrack. So I just think it just kind of, that always reinforced me of just like the right source will help us persevere. The wrong source will just feed our fear. You know, there's a little poem for you there. So the right source will help us persevere while the wrong source will just feed our fear. And I would notice that when they would do that, they were just like, no, I'm pretty sure I'm bipolar. I'm like, you have no symptoms. Nope, I'm sure I am. And then they just got more fearful and I've, I've had like six panic attacks while I've been talking to you right now. I'm like, wow, you're doing really well. You should like write a book or something. So it was just like that idea of when we're, we gotta make sure we're looking for the right source. How do you know if it's the right source? Because the right source will always confirm what God has already said. If God hadn't said it, then it's probably not a source you wanna be looking at. And the internet's full of a lot of weird stuff. And I'm not saying it's bad. The internet's got a great, just like any other tool, it can be used for good or bad. But I think just being able to realize that when we're waiting for God, it's so easy to start looking for things that just confirm what, what we're fearful about, what we're thinking about. Oh, you know, God's not going to come through. And this guy that I was just talking to the other day who I just met, who I don't even know about, he said this. Well, it must be true, you know. And so I just think sometimes it's very easy to go down that path if we're not careful. So definitely making sure that we are, you know, listening to the right sources. The third thing we want to be careful of is that we want to make sure that we are leaving it in God's hands. Now, this sounds like a duh, but it is super hard to do. You know, you look at Genesis 16:4, and it's a very short little verse, but it kind of says exactly where Abraham got off track. He had listened to the enemy speaking through his wife, and then it says he slept with Hagar, and she conceived. So he took it out of God's hands. God said, I'm going to bring a child through your wife. And he's like, no, nope, we'll try this other path. You know, he got anxious, impatient, and created a whole other race of human beings that God still blessed through Ishmael. But I don't know if that was God's plan. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it was or wasn't, but I don't know if it was God's timing. All I know is that Abraham created a lot of chaos simply by taking it out of God's hands. And it's really hard because we're just, when we're struggling sometimes and things have been going longer, we're really good at keeping in God's hands for about 20, 30 minutes, you know? And then we immediately want to go, well, you know, he's, he, I gave him a good shot. I, I did send a prayer. And I, I think I'm going to just try it my way. And so it always reminds me when I was a kid, my mom got, was just, I feel bad for her because at the time, this was before cable, so if you watched television past 1 a.m., which I shouldn't have been, but of course I was, it was all infomercials, just one after the other after the other. And all of them were about how you could get rich quick. Well, here you got an impulsive guy like myself who's going, boy, I could sell knives that I know nothing about. I could sell this that I know nothing about. I don't even care about that product, but I'm pretty sure I could do it. And then it was always like, you could work like 3.2 hours in a month and make like $10,000 a week. And I'm like, you got me. You pretty much had me at three hours a month. <laughs> so it just made me think like that's our temptation is instead of me learning to just say, okay, God, your way of finances is going to be slower, but it's going to teach me how to save. It's going to teach me how to do things. It wasn't until years later when I went through Dave Ramsey, got some things figured out that I was able to start doing it God's way. But it just, it always reminds me when I look at that is like, we're always looking for the quick path. And unfortunately, it's not the best path most of the time. You know, my mom was constantly sending back things that I was ordering. And so it didn't take me too long to realize she got the mail before I did. So it really was a waste of my time. But that was back when you could do COD. You know, so anybody, if, you, if you're old enough to know what that is, I'm not going to explain it to anybody else. So it's like VCR years. So it just kind of shows, I liked what one person said one time, and I really believe this is true. If Satan can't derail us with a frontal assault, he will try and push us from behind, so we speed up, 
get frustrated and impatient and take the easy sinful path. And you saw this in the life of um, Abraham. And we didn't see this as much, you know, in uh, Joseph's life. He was falsely accused, but that wasn't because of something he was trying to do. So I don't know. It took 25 years from the time that Abraham was promised this to the time it came about. I don't know if God's plan was to have that be shorter. But we'll never know. And the chaos that Abraham created because of his choices to take the easy path, you know, has caused a lot of problems to this day. So, so just something to think about. And then the other part is kind of going that brings me to my last principle for tonight. Um, I'm not closing, just last principle, by the way, here, so. Yeah, so the idea is, is that if people say, well, how do you deal with that? You know, if you want to leave it in God's hands, how do you do that? Because you got all this antsy energy. You want to just like, I want to, I want to do this or want to do that. And because I think what our tendency is, is we either shut down when we're, when we're struggling or we want to do more than what God wants us to do. We want to do it a different way. And this has been really apparent for me lately because I think I've been buying into this, this mistaken belief sometimes that a lot of us do. It's like says, when this, then I kind of thinking. When this gets accomplished, then I'll do that for you, Lord. When you fulfill this thing, then I'll go to this or do that. So when this, then I thinking. And I've really noticed this with my dad for those of you who don't know, uh, about a year ago, my dad was uh, diagnosed with a, an, an incurable uh, liver disorder, and um, it's just basically a cirrhosis of the liver. I'm not going to bore you with all the details of it. I couldn't pronounce it anyway. And, but basically, it's, it's just like without a liver transplant, he's not going to get better. They can only treat the symptoms. Now, we believe that God's going to do a miracle, either this side of heaven or on the other side. And yet what I was noticing over the last couple of months, I was telling my wife, like, I can't put my finger on it, but I'm just aimless. I was getting up in the morning, and I was just like, I couldn't focus on anything. I could, nothing seemed, I didn't want to do anything. Because my thought was, okay, God, as soon as you heal my dad, then I'll make plans for this. Then I'll decide I wasn't thinking about the fall or, or any of those kinds of things. Because the enemy tricks us into just kind of going, well, as soon as, you know, you just got to wait for this. And I think then all of a sudden you just become in this holding pattern where you're not productive for anybody. And I know, knowing my dad well enough, that he wouldn't want me to just be marking time while God does something in his life either. He's never been like that. And so I just think that that's something that I've had to really just say, okay, God, what do you want me to do today? I don't know about tomorrow, but what do you want me to do today? How do I take daily purposeful steps while you are waiting for God to answer a prayer, fulfill a promise, or do a miracle. Those daily purposeful steps. Sometimes it's just, you know, I got up. I got up. But there was purpose to that as well. So we're going to wrap up here. Uh, for those of you online, um, uh, we'll end in just a second here. But I want to just, uh, because we can't play the video online, there's a song I love from uh, the movie Fireproof. And it's uh, by John Walker, and it's called While I'm Waiting. If you've never seen the movie Fireproof with uh, uh, Kirk Cameron, definitely worth your time. Great movie. But uh, I just want to read the chorus for those online just to be able to go over it, and, um, and then we'll, we'll kind of end the, that part. So it says in the chorus, he says, While I'm waiting, I will serve you. While I'm waiting, I will worship. While I'm waiting, I will not faint. I'll be running the race even while I wait. So sometimes it's that idea that, you know, maybe you don't know what else to do, but while you're waiting, you can worship God. He's, he didn't get less deserving just because something's not happening the way you want. You can serve God. You can be serving other people. You know, maybe it's just like there's been days where I didn't know what else to do, and I just went out and was shoveling snow with, out of my driveway. To, with a, or a neighbor's driveway or something, you know, just do something purposeful, you know, but just being able to serve, being able to worship, I will not faint while I'm waiting. So you can go ahead and, and end the live feed.